Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. It's really wonderful to be with you all. Last time I was with you, we were upstairs, and our numbers were smaller. Um, thank you all for the invitation to come back again. But above and beyond that, thank you for creating and holding a space where we talk about love and creativity and the moment we're in and how much relationship and community matters as we navigate the troubled waters of this time. Uh, Mike and Rachel reached out and extended this invitation, and I was honored and flattered, and I went home and talked to my wife, Megan, who's over there, and our son, Calvin, who brought his fishing pole this morning. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. <laughs> and I said, I was invited to give a talk about courage, and she said, that's nervy. <laughs> um, my friend Bennett rightly intuited when I told him I was nervous that this was a moment to try to exercise courage. So here we are. Um, I want to begin with a couple of operating principles for what I mean when I talk about courage. The first is that courage resides within each of us. It is a deep and ever-replenishing reservoir, not unlike love. And in the course of our lives, we will be called upon to act from a place of courage again and again and again. And sometimes that will be in the most joyous moments, when we confess our love to someone for the first time, when we overcome physical barriers and run a marathon or climb a peak. Sometimes it will be in moments of anguish and sorrow as we find a way to move through grief and loss, as we battle disease, as collectively we mourn the kind of tragedies we're experiencing in our country right now from Sacramento, California, to Parkland, Florida, to Asheville, North Carolina. All of these moments ask us to respond with courage and with love. It's not the job of any single one of us to always respond with courage. But collectively, it's our task to figure out how to move through life with courage, especially as a community. So that's one premise. We've all got courage. It runs deep in us. And in our lives, we will act from a place of courage many, many, many times, often in moments when we least expected to be called to do so. Premise number two, courage and change are inextricably linked to each other. I think that because when we act from a place of courage, we change. It's like a phase change. We go from solid to liquid to gas. We become, maybe for 30 seconds, maybe for a few hours or a few days, a better version of ourselves. More powerful, stronger, able to see and speak more clearly. But it's not just us who changes. When one person acts from courage, other people see that and are often summoned to act from courage as well. They have the opportunity and invitation to change. And in most powerful moments, it's not just individuals, it's also communities that can be summoned to act from collective courage and to change. So these are our premises, or my premises, as we move into this morning's conversation. Each of us possesses courage, and when we talk about courage, we also talk about change. I want to tell you a few stories. These stories are about Mississippi. The first one is from July 2013 in Gulfport, Mississippi. Anyone ever been to Gulfport? Some of you have. My friend Aaron Sarver has been to Gulfport. He works with me on the Campaign for Southern Equality, as does my friend Maya Washington. In July of 2013, it was hot in Gulfport. And the Campaign for Southern Equality team was there as part of the We Do campaign. We were spending a good chunk of that July touring the state of Mississippi, from Poplarville to Gulfport to Jackson to Hattiesburg to Tupelo, standing with LGBTQ couples as they requested marriage licenses in their hometowns and were denied, knowing they would be denied, and doing that for three reasons. 
One, to shine a light on the reality that LGBTQ people live literally in every single community in our country, including Poplarville, Mississippi, and Gulfport, Mississippi. Two, and think back to 2013, to shine a light on the reality that LGBTQ folks in the South were no longer going to participate in a devil's bargain that said to us, if you stay silent, if you stay closeted, if you act as if you don't want to be treated equally, then you will be safe. Instead, we're going to begin to resist laws that dehumanize us. And number three, to shine a very bright light on the moment at a marriage license counter when a state law that said that same-sex couples could not marry went from being an abstraction and black letters on the page of the Mississippi State Legal Code into being an embodied reality because a specific couple was being denied a marriage license. That's what we were doing. We did it in dozens of communities across the South, standing with thousands and thousands of people, and each and every step of the way, talking about how what we were doing was absolutely linked to an incredible legacy of civil rights organizing around racial justice and direct action in the South. We were standing on the shoulders of giants. And that morning in Gulfport, the sun was beating down on us. And for months and months, we'd been talking to one very brave family. And we'd said, do you think you're ready to do this? We want you to think about what it will mean for you to come out in this way. You're going to be on the front page of most newspapers across Mississippi. And you're going to be on the front page of some national newspapers. That means you're going to be out in every single part of your life with your family, your faith community, at work, in your neighborhood, as you go to the grocery store. What does that risk mean in your life? And is that a risk you can absorb right now and take on? And there was one family in Gulfport that said, we're ready to do this, and our kids are going to stand with us, and our friends are going to stand with us. And so that morning, we gathered in a queer bar, the only queer bar in Gulfport. We always tried to find a place to gather before these actions. Sometimes it was a library. Sometimes it was a church. But when we got to be in a bar, it was the most fun. <laughs> And we listened to Rihanna, and we said a blessing, and we walked out the door into the hot, beating sun, and two by two, we processed down the streets of Gulfport, Mississippi. We were undeniably a queer procession marching through the streets of Gulfport, and I was wearing my clergy collar. And we arrived at the municipal building where marriage license offices, marriage licenses were handed out. This is a building that also housed district court and other administrative functions of the county. You can imagine it. In this case, it was a fairly squat municipal building. And you could sort of see the gulf in the distance. And the sun was beating down on us. And outside the building, we stopped and we made a circle and we joined hands and we bowed our head. And we began to say a public prayer. We prayed for the strength and the courage to complete this action. That is, to go into a building where we'd been told we had no right to be, and to go up to a counter where we'd been told we had no right to be because we had no right to love and we had no right to be who we truly are in the towns that we lived in. We prayed for the strength and courage to do that with our heads held high, but also from a posture of love and empathy towards every single person we encountered, including the people who would make the denial. And finally, we played for the strength and courage to really understand in the moment the legacy that we were stepping into, that we were paying homage to, of people who had put their lives in the line in Mississippi decades earlier to say every single person in our country and black people in our country must be treated equally. We prayed for the strength and courage to hold all of that at once and to dare to believe that the actions on a hot July day in 2013 in Gulfport could possibly ripple out in other ways and touch people's lives. And as we did that, people started streaming into the court building. It was the beginning of the day. Business was getting started. And people were sort of watching us and pausing. And one woman stopped, pulled out her phone, and said, oh my god, those homos are praying. It's OK to laugh. Oh my god, those homos are praying. <laughs> and it's true, we were praying. And she zeroed in on exactly what we were doing. We were creating spectacle. We were reclaiming public space. We were as queer as you could be in that space, in a space we were told we didn't belong. And we were reclaiming faith and the rituals of faith in the public square. It is a nervy thing to create spectacle, especially when spectacle is about your body and the core of who you are. And it takes a lot of courage, and mostly it took courage from the folks who lived in Gulfport. This was their hometown. 
We went inside that day and up to the counter and things proceeded as we expected, which is to say, Candy and Sabrina requested a marriage license as their kids watched and they were denied. And we walked back outside holding our heads high and we processed back to the queer bar and we put Rihanna back on <laughs> and we celebrated what had happened with Joy because what was true that day was that they had acted from a place of their full humanity and they had claimed that truth and said, the reality of this state law in Mississippi that dehumanizes me is a transient one and it's not true, it's not about truth. And that's a lot to celebrate. Flash forward about a year and we're back in Mississippi, this time with some of the same families who've been part of the We Do campaign and a team of attorneys, some of the best litigators in the country. And we file a federal lawsuit challenging that state law in Mississippi that says same-sex couples can't marry. Flash forward from there about six months and Judge Carlton Reeves, a US federal judge, the second African-American person to serve as a federal judge in the state of Mississippi, issues a sweeping opinion of all the marriage equality opinions. This is the one you must read. And remember his name because he should serve on the US Supreme Court in our lifetimes. His name is Judge Carlton Reeves. And he ruled that that Mississippi law was unconstitutional and that same-sex couples had a fundamental right to marry. The state of Mississippi doubled down and said, we're going to the Fifth Circuit. And so that ruling was stayed, meaning it didn't go into effect. Flash forward about six months and the US Supreme Court handed down a ruling in Obergefell saying, yes, indeed, same-sex couples in every single community in this nation have a fundamental right to marry. And we had the great honor of working with families and organizers across Mississippi and that same legal team to ensure that in the days following that ruling, Mississippi became one of the first states in the South where every single county was complying with that ruling. Can Mississippi change? Yes. <laughs> Does Mississippi always change? No. <laughs> Do we have a lot of work to do? Absolutely. I could have said North Carolina in each of those instances too. <laughs> Let's just make sure we're clear on that point. Flash forward to April 2016, the Mississippi State Legislature responding in part of the backlash wave to that Obergefell ruling, to that ruling by Judge Reeves, passes a law called HB 1523. Most people have never heard of it. It is the most draconian anti-LGBTQ law in the nation. It says that government employees, service providers like physicians and business owners can deny services and treatment to LGBTQ folks on the basis of their religious beliefs. We got into court with those, legal, with those lawyers immediately and for 18 months we were able to hold this law at bay. But the state of Mississippi continued to fight and fight and fight and as of October 2017, that law is now in effect in Mississippi. Does Mississippi change? Sometimes, not always. Flash forward to February 2018, a group of students at Mississippi State University in Starkville Starkville, Mississippi, form a group called Starkville Pride, and they decide they want to hold the first ever Pride Festival in Starkville. So Emily and Bailey research what needs to happen. One thing that needs to happen is you need a permit from the city of Starkville. So they meet with city staff and they get instructions and they complete the permit application and they cross every T and they dot every I and they show up at a city council meeting and submit it. There's no real known history of the city of Starkville's Board of Aldermen ever denying a permit request. But that night, debate began and there was public comment and city council went into closed session and they reemerged and in silence quickly took a vote 4-3 to deny the permit. None of the people who voted to deny the permit would go on public record about their motivation for their vote. But from their past voting record and other things they'd had to say on the subject, it was pretty clear that they felt like they, an event like this didn't belong in Starkville because LGBT people in Starkville didn't have the right to claim the streets of Starkville as their own for a day. We got on the phone with Emily and Bailey. We said, Are you all, what do you all want to do? And they said, we want to fight. These are seniors in college. We're ready to fight. We want to have pride in Starkville. And so we connected with them with that same legal team who had struck down the ban on marriage equality, who also had struck down a ban on adoption for same-sex couples. And within days, they'd filed a federal lawsuit suing the city of Starkville, saying this was a patently discriminatory act. And then some interesting things started to happen. Apparently the city attorney read the lawsuit and realized that there was no way to win. <laughs> this was a slam dunk from a legal perspective. Those don't come around every single day. 
So the Board of Aldermen met again, and upon advice from council, somehow reversed their vote, voting 4-3 this time to grant the permit, and giving Starkville Pride organizers about 10 days to pull together a Pride Festival. This past Saturday on March 24th, they did. 3,000 people converged on the streets of Starkville. An incredible, incredible day. <clears throat> It was the first ever Pride Festival, but it was also the largest ever festival or parade to ever happen in the history of Starkville. <laughs> the largest ever. That's pretty powerful and it's pretty beautiful. And that's because Bailey and Emily said, we're not giving up. We're fighting this. We have this vision. We're going to make this happen. So that was last Saturday, March 24th. Also on Saturday, the streets of Sacramento, California were filled with people marching and protesting in response to the murder of Stefan, a 20-year-old young man who was shot 20 times and murdered by police because he was standing in his backyard holding a phone. And instead of seeing a young man standing in his backyard holding a phone, police thought they saw something different, and they murdered him. Leaders in Sacramento, including youth leaders, are standing up and saying no more. Also that day, the streets of communities across the United States, including Asheville, including Washington, D.C., were filled with people participating in the March for Our Lives, led by students from the south side of Chicago, from Parkland, from Newtown, who'd experienced the absolute worst of humanity who'd been at school when there were mass shootings, and who in that crucible of terror and grief has, have somehow found a way to lead our country right now. And to say no more, we're not participating in this devil's bargain, where we just accept as a fact of American life that the NRA has a stranglehold on our politics, and that children are not safe when they go to daycare or school, or when they walk home from the grocery store in Chicago. And they have found within themselves a kind of courage I can only begin to imagine. These are kids who were cowering under desks and in closets, and now they've put their bodies front and center in one of the most contested debates in our country. And they are leading our nation right now. That's courage. That's spectacle. That's tapping into the best angels that can exist within us. I personally can't talk about courage without talking about faith in my own life. I don't think it was intentional, but y'all invited a Christian minister to come talk about courage on Good Friday. <laughs> and that's cool. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about my faith. And I recognize there are a lot of faith traditions in the room, and probably a lot of folks who aren't part of any faith tradition, probably some folks who've been hurt by religion. I'm going to share a little bit about my story. The story of this week in the Christian tradition is a story of courage. It's a story about Jesus and his disciples, but Jesus really making a decision to go into Jerusalem. It's during the week of Passover. There were a lot of reasons to be there. But Jesus knew that he was going to be persecuted and arrested and crucified. He knew it was only a matter of time before that happened, but he knew that if he went into Jerusalem during the week of Passover, when military and imperial forces were also sure to be there, that that was pretty risky. This is a core story of my faith tradition. And there's a lot of ways it gets told, and maybe you've heard it told in a lot of different ways, and maybe you've heard it told as a story of pomp and circumstance in some regards. But what I hear and the way it's been told to me and the way it's registered with me is that this is a story about Jesus going into Jerusalem on a colt, the most humble of animals, at, while at the same time a military procession was coming into Jerusalem filled with soldiers marching in rhythm and on horses and carrying weapons. He went in on a colt. 
with a group described as peasants and anyone who wanted to be part of his movement and his procession. And when Jesus was in Jerusalem, he went into the temples, which were the site of power and wealth and also a belief that the sacred and holy could only happen within the walls of a temple at certain times of day with uh, certain kind of people administering rites and rituals to do that. And Jesus' message was, folks, we've got it all wrong. We should be talking about peace and justice and mercy. We should be talking about the beauty of all people and the divinity of all people. We should be talking about the fact that the sacred and holy can happen anywhere. It can happen over dinner with a group of prostitutes and beggars, which at the time would have been one way to talk about outsiders. That's where I would have been as a queer person. That was the message. That story is the one I think about more than any other as I try to understand the moment we're in. A moment when each of us faces a variation on the question of what does it mean to go into your Jerusalem? That is to say, what does it mean to move towards something that is hard and risky and could change you versus running for the hills? What does it mean to directly confront power structures that oppress and persecute and to speak a message of truth and justice and mercy and love and courage in the face of that kind of power. We are living in a time where our president has called for a military parade. These are not abstractions for us to contemplate. None of this is abstract. That's where I go in my own life when I need to replenish. On those nights when the voices of hope and the voices of deep despair are battling in my head. When my wife and I are up late talking about the unspeakable, which is how do we keep our son safe in the world. When we are watching families like family in Sacramento grieve. When we are watching our community respond to the beating of Mr. Johnny Rush. For me, this is one of the places I go to get replenished. To hear the call that part of our task as individuals and part of our task together is to confront injustice when we see it, to resist persecution and hold, to hold up the truth that we are all fully human. We are all, in the language I would use, equal in God's eyes. I'm going to close today not by talking about my story, but by inviting you to think about yours. Each of you possesses extraordinary courage. There's a couple hundred folks in this room each of you could probably have gotten up here and given a talk about what courage means in your own life, what you've seen it mean in the lives of those dear to you. Courage can mean fighting for your marriage. Courage can mean seeking treatment for addiction. Courage can mean getting outside and walking around the block because your doctor told you if you don't start exercising, you're facing a heart attack in the next few months. Courage can mean getting really clear about something. It can mean using the power that you have. Right now in my own life, what's really, really clear to me is that a white, as a white person, I need to change the way that I show up around race and racial justice. Word. This issue has mattered deeply to me for as long as I can remember. So in my case, it's not a question of waking up and realizing I've never engaged around racial justice issues. I was raised by my mother to do that work. And I've done it. And that's not enough. More is required of us. And I don't know the answers to all of that. But I know that right here, right now in Asheville, we've got to find new ways to step up. We are a disproportionately white city facing a crisis around the way black people are treated by our law enforcement. We've got to raise our voices. We cannot be silent in these moments. I know that in my own life. Each and every one of you has a question to ask yourselves. What are you being called to right now that would require courage? What do you need to act from that place of courage? 
You are a dazzlingly beautiful group of people. You fill this room with love. It's palpable. It's powerful. My invitation to you is to go forth and act with courage. Thank you. Mm -hmm.